friends, and welcome back to another chapter of Don't Feed the Bully. So, in our last chapter, chapter 8, um, Kurt tried to get Handy and or Ralphie in trouble, and it didn't really work the way Kurt had planned. Handy thought fast and was able to come up with a scenario of there was a wasp or a bee, and... Apparently, Kurt is allergic to them, so he got out of it, but now I wonder what's going to happen in Chapter 9. I wonder how Kurt is going to retaliate. What do you think, you all? Well, let's find out in Chapter 9. Kurt was not going to underestimate me again. I knew he was plotting because he never raised his hand in class again that day. And for a know-it-all like Kurt to resist being the center of all knowledge was akin to a wolf deciding cabbage was a better food choice. He sat muttering to himself like the homeless man downtown that talks to Elvis all day. Why old, pe why old crazy people always talk to Elvis, I will never figure out. People under 20 hardly know who Elvis is anymore. I wondered to whom my generation was going to mumble that night as I was writing my fifth complaint to the Agitators Awareness Society. I ended up writing Hillary Duff instead of Zach Brewer before snapping myself back to reality. Sometimes multitasking is not the answer. Every day I put a new complaint in the box and nothing has been done, positively or negatively. I knew I was getting under Kurt's skin because he was stewing about like a stray dog after 29 and a half days in the pound. Zach Brewer and his friend had also, also had me on their radar. I'm no psychic, but I could tell Kurt's thugs were privy to what my notes said about them because their ignoring of me bordered on contempt. I needed to spur him into action, so this complaint said I would take my grievance to the principal's office if I did not see any action soon. Be ready, Handy, I thought as I put the note and copies of all the other notes in my bag. I might need them as evidence soon. I fought off my root beer cravings, and I hopped in the sack to get a mountain of rest. Tomorrow might be a long day. The next morning slipped by without incident, and 98% and a 98% on the geography quiz on state capitals. This case was going, this case was causing my grades to suffer. I switched Bismarck with Pierre and Concord with Montiplier. A rookie mistake. At least I didn't put St. Louis down for Missouri like 60% of the class. I also avoided Ka Kayla and Ralphie, which hurt even more now because I knew them. Wasting time not having good friends was a lonely business. I missed hanging out with them even when I was buying the Slurpees. Always being on guard is tiring, and maybe Kurt knew that too. His plan may have been to wait for me to show a little weakness, then he could pounce. Jim ended as usual, and I was the first one in the locker room to pick up my backpack. The rest of the class filed in as I was, as I was opening the lock that kept my bag from more homework nappers. No one else used locks because... Thievery was virtually non-existent at William B. Travis, but I justified it to questions by saying that one homework prank on me was enough. The scream pierced the locker room like an air horn in a pup tent. Crying bellowed forth next with sobs so deep I didn't know if penguins could hold their breath so long. I ran toward the cries and pushed my way through the massing, smelly sixth grade boy gawk fest. It was Anson Summerhead digging at his eyes as if they'd just seen his grandma in her underwear by mistake and wanted out of his head. "'What's wrong?' I screamed as I bent down to try to look into his eyes. No luck. Anson was hysterical with pain. I looked around at the throng of frightened students. "'Anyone see what happened?' I asked. "'He just put on his glasses and started screaming,' I heard from behind my back." Anson Summerhead was serious about his glasses, or more correct to say, his parents were serious about him never breaking his glasses. He always changed into those hard plastic sports glasses that make you look like a paintball target for gym class so his good pair would not catch a dodgeball seconds before his face did. Anson continued to scream, and I said, Hold on, buddy. I picked up Anson's 
glasses and liquid ran down the lenses as if someone had sprayed 409 all over them. I smelled it, and it was not 409. Help me get him into the shower, I said. Now! I handed Anson's glasses to Ralphie. Don't lose those or wipe them off. Jade and Frank grabbed Anson's other arm, and we dragged him to the shower. Go get the nurse, I yelled as someone ran from the room. We dumped Anson under the water, and I held his head up to let the water pour into his blazing eyes. You're going to be okay, I said to Anson. He was still bawling, but you could see the water's easing effect, like the first steps into the ocean after crossing a sea of burning sand. What's going on here, Mr. Greatneck? The nurse said, running into the room. Someone sprayed mace onto Anson's glasses, I said. Ralphie? Ralphie produced the grasses. How do you know what mace is, Hannibal? She asked. I toured a police station last year, I said. My uncle is the captain. I even saw a demonstration of the use of mace, and this is the same effect. At first, I thought it was glass cleaner, which would sting, but pepper spray would hurt a great deal more, which I could miss getting in the eyes. I knew I needed to rinse his eyes, and since it was not sprayed into his eyes, it was easier to clear. Unlike glass cleaner, mace has no real lasting effects. The nurse pulled Anson from the shower, still in pain, but no longer hysterical. He now looked like a drenched cat with severe allergy problems. It's a good thing you were here, Mr. Greatneck, the nurse said, heading Anson up the stairs as the, gla the class settled out. The shower soaked Anson, but I had only gotten my sleeve and pant legs wet, so not needing new clothes. I paused for a second to consider who might profit from this assault. If they were trying to frame me, this stunk worse than a cable showing of Ernest goes to camp. I was the first one back to the locker room, but had no time to get out Anson's glasses, spray them, and hide the mace. If Kurt or his writing party did this, they were taking criminal reform school chances. Taz, hush! Come here, baby! Sorry, guys, my dog is barking. Everyone was halfway back to the class as I picked up my backpack and headed up the stairs to class. Furthermore, I thought, how could Kurt think anyone would think I would put mace on anyone's, someone's glasses? The nurse said it was good that I was around, and I'm always the first to help. Arg! I yelled in my head with an epiphany that snapped my brain stem in two. Of course! Kurt knew I'd be the first to help. It was a diversion. Yikes! I pulled up my backpack. I never call myself stupid. But Dunder had it fit very well. There was nothing new in the police department, but all the copies and my complaints were gone. Great, I thought. This is not part of their plan to take some copies of evidence. They wouldn't even know they wouldn't even know was there. This was a small gift for me. I kept searching. There was nothing in their pockets than bingo. To da and help. Oh, I checked the padding in between the shoulder straps in the main compartment and found a plastic knife. Was it irony that just a week before Kayla, Ralphie and I were discussing plastic knives in connection with suspension? Since we hadn't studied irony yet, and I only knew the word from an old song my cousin liked, I moved my head, I moved my mind to other matters. Matters like the fact that Zach Power was coming out of the principal's office with the principal. It take take a nuclear science to, to figure out where they were going. I jumped back down the stairs into the locker room. This place is causing me all sorts of trouble this year. I had less than a minute to figure out a solution. In my favor was a principal that walked with the gait of a three-legged turtle. I looked around quick. Kurt was smart, because I simply threw it away or tried to hide it, then an extensive search of the locker room put a great deal of suspicion on me. Add that to Zach's... Add that to Zach's made-up eyewitness account of seeing me put the knife in my bag, and... All my complaints vanished as evidence of their frame, and I was looking as guilty as the cookie monster in Oreo Village. <laughs> Think fast, Handy, I muttered. That your backpack? The voice surprised me like a roach jumping out of the box of candy. It was the janitor. And there ends... Oh, wait, no. Chapter 9 keeps going. Is that your backpack? He asked again, slower as he noticed a plastic knife in my hand. Where did you get that? It was in my backpack, I said, try still trying to come up with a plan. Oh, that's why that other boy was over here while everyone else was in the shower, he said. Which boy, I asked. One of the two who was picking on you the other day, he said. 
Did you see him put it in? I asked, a small glimmer of hope flashing across my face. No, he said. I came in late and just saw him the deck walk away. I could tell the principal that much. Thank you, I said, but that's not good enough. You get caught with that and you're going to be in big trouble, he said, as he pulled out his full head key chain and shook it at me before selecting the key to lock up the blur room. It'd be sad to see you expelled after the way you helped that other boy. Sorry I didn't see enough to get you off the hook. The answer hit me like an iceberg, and I turned to the janitor with a question only he could answer. Do you have any glue? What is he going to do with glue, you think? I do not like to call myself a genius, but luck mixed with a touch of panic can be the path to inspiration. The janitor's door had just closed him into the boiler room. I was still zipping up my backpack when Principal Perryman and Zach Brewer came in. Mr. Greatneck! Mr. Greatneck! Principal Perryman said with a serious voice adults use when they want your name to substitute for shut up, stop it, or how dare you. Will you please, o will you please open your backpack? Sure, I said, stalling a second to see if Zach would pipe up and annoy the principal. He did not disappoint. I saw him put it in there, Zach blurted out, excited to hurry this up to the part where I get in trouble. Mr. Brewer, Principal Perryman said, I will handle this. I'm sorry, I said. What did you see? The knife! Zach practically screamed, pointing to my backpack, as if there were some confusion as to which backpack we were talking about, and to emphasize the fact that he was nervous and had nothing to do with his hands. That is enough, Mr. Brewer, the principal said. Zach wasn't annoying. He was making the principal angry. Mr. Greatneck, he continued, please open your backpack. I stood for a second, acting confused, then put a wide smile on my face. Oh, I get it, I said as I opened my bag and reached deep inside. I have never seen a man as fast with glue and a pair of tin snips as the janitor. When seconds of telling him my idea, he grabbed a plastic knife, cut off the blade, threw it in the boiler room, yanked out a tub of super glue, decapitated his keychain, and glued his oversized troll head on the knife handle. Then I pulled it out of the backpack, already dry. Zach deflated faster than a Macy's Thanksgiving Day balloon in an archery contest. He must have seen the handle of my art project, I said, handing the old autograph to the principal. There's no blade, but it is a plastic knife handle. Art is not my best thing. I know this looks kind of like a troll pop, but Zach saw the handle when I put it in the bag. I can see where he might be concerned. I should have thought of that and informed the office at the start of school. Yes, Mr. Greyneck, said Principal Perryman, handing me back the troll on a stick, as if it offended his artistic sensibilities, but not his safety ones. But this isn't a problem. Sorry to have bothered you. Now both of you get back to your classes. Sorry to worry you, Zach, I said and smirked at him. You are very brave to bring this to the attention of the principal. I walked ahead to Principal Perryman. Sir, may I go to the nurse's office, I asked, leaving Zach to ponder his failure. Slink back to Kurt to repent and possibly watch Kurt's face burn a brilliant red. And now we're at the end of chapter nine. Whoa! A lot happened in this chapter, didn't it, guys? What do you think of Kurt's next way of trying to get Handy in trouble? Putting a plastic knife in his backpack? What do you think of the way Handy changed it into a troll pop that's hilarious a troll pop what do you think kurt's gonna try to do next what do you think handy's gonna do now that his complaint notes were stolen how is he gonna take it to the principal let me guy let me know guys and i hope you're having a good day i miss each and every one of you bye friends